When the snow tower lies sundered, kingless, bleeding, the world eater wakes, and the wheel turns upon the last dragonborn. The premise of Skyrim is summed in these two lines, and from the beginning of the game you are thrust into a world fraying at the seams, each thread dangling before those who wish to unthread the fabric of the world. You are sitting upon a cart, bound and captured amongst Stormcloak rebels, and not only the foot soldiers, but the very man to whom the rebellion owes its origin, Jarl Ulfric Stormcloak. You, whoever you are, are destined for Helgen, and as you enter through her gates at the mercy of the Imperials, you are quickly made privy to the political firestorm that ravages the land. But before your head is lopped off by an executioner, a dragon, a terrible creature of ages past, returns and provides opportunity for escape. The choice of Ralof the Stormcloak and Hadvar the Imperial is before you, and this is truly the first taste of the conflict. Skyrim came out in 2011. It's an old game, which means the central political conflict of the setting has been under robust discussion for the last decade, a conversation that we here at Fudge Muppet have been a part of, and as role players known for our Skyrim builds, you will know that we have played and immersed ourselves in characters of both sides of the conflict, creating the rationale and logical through lines that determine a character's outlook. Unfortunately, when it comes to the debate between Stormcloaks versus Imperials, I often find the most uncharitable conversations occur, those that quickly devolve into accusations and stonewalling, and two, I find that this entire debate is often stripped of the context of its setting, and the subjective realities of its inhabitants. These people live in societies where gods and magic are tangible and have measurable outcomes that can determine the fate of the world. They live in societies where nobility, lineages, conquest and traditions are the norm. Look. Put simply, the main players of the Civil War are all antithetical to modern sensibilities and values such as religious freedom, representative democracy, or even our sense of justice. Therefore, when giving an analysis of this conflict, I think it's fitting to understand it in terms of its context and the perspectives of these people. Skyrim Civil War is far more complicated than you think, so today, we're going to go through each of the main players, analyze the historical context of the factions to better understand their motivations, scrutinize the figureheads of the conflict, and try to present their ideologies and goals with a lack of bias. Let's begin with an initial summary of the conflict so we know that we're all on the same page. The Stormcloak Rebellion was initiated by Jarl Ulfric Stormcloak of Windhelm when he killed High King Torig, ruler of Skyrim, to whom all the Jarls swear fealty. To the Imperials, this was regicide, whereas the Stormcloaks claim this was an honorable duel accepted in tradition of the old ways. Embellishment and justification appears from both parties, but eyewitnesses such as Sibyl Stentor, the court wizard of the Blue Palace in Solitude, says, Ulfric showed up at the Gates of Solitude, requesting an audience. We thought he was here to ask Torig to declare independence. By the time we realized Ulfric was here to challenge Torig, it was already too late. By Nord custom, once the challenge was issued in court, Torig had no choice but to accept. Had he not, Ulfric would have had cause to call a new moot and a new vote for High King. Torig had some martial training, of course, but it mattered little that day. When Ulfric's lips parted, when he unleashed the power of the Thum, that shout, that ancient and terrible tongue, ripped Torg asunder. I'm willing to put stock in Sibyl's recount as an eyewitness. Ulfric himself also claims he ended Torg, but said the killing blow was the sword. Not entirely true, though not entirely false either. Any Nord can learn the way of the voice by studying with the Greybeards given enough ambition and dedication. My shouting Torg to the ground proved he had neither. However, it was my sword piercing his heart that killed him. Like the Stormcloaks say, Ulfric did challenge High King Torig according to Nordic custom, which seemingly is one of those traditions that, while valid, is not initiated often. The ethical dilemma involved here is that Ulfric knowingly put Torig in a position that almost certainly spelled his doom. If Torig had refused to accept this challenge, Ulfric would have been able to seize power through calling a new moot predicated on the king's cowardice and breaking of tradition, whereas if Torig accepted the challenge, he would die as he was a young man against a great war veteran with some mastery of the thumb. I killed Torik to prove our wretched condition. How is the High King supposed to be the defender of Skyrim if he can't even defend himself? 
I challenged him in the traditional way, and he accepted. There were many witnesses. No murder was committed. True, he didn't stand a chance against me, but that was precisely the point. He was a puppet king of the Empire, not a high king of Skyrim. His father before him, perhaps, but not Torik. He was too privileged and too foolish. More interested in entertaining his queen than ruling his country. The Imperial sentiment is that Ulfric essentially pushed Torig into a corner, where in either scenario, Ulfric would appear the righteous to many. However, to call this a murder in the legalistic sense would be a lie on the Empire's part. Stormcloaks would say Torig had the ability to refuse, and if he chose not to, then he would have to endure the consequences of being a coward. So, of the inciting event from a traditional, customary, legalistic perspective, one could say that Ulfric Stormcloak was justified, or rather acted within law. It was not regicide. However, in a more nuanced and perhaps from an ethical perspective, it could be considered unfair or perhaps dishonorable, at least to an outsider to Skyrim. Either way, it's complicated, but I do ultimately think accusing Ulfric of regicide in any legal sense is based upon shoddy ground. At the end of the day, Torig did have a choice to deny the challenge. He was just aware of the dire consequences for his rule if he did so, and hence he accepted. The rest of this fateful event is not understood in full. Presumably, upon the death of Torig, the guards, I would assume Legion troops, tried to arrest him, which seems unjustified considering that they all adhered to the law and watched the duel between Ulfric and Torig. So naturally, Ulfric sought to escape the city under attempted arrest. In fact, when we first enter Solitude, we witness the execution of Rogvir, a member of the city guard who opened the gates and allowed Ulfric to escape. Rogvir. You helped Ulfric Stormcloak escape the city after he murdered High King Torig. By opening that gate for Ulfric, you betrayed the people of Solitude. Traitor! There was no murder. Ulfric None. challenged Torig. He beat the High King in fair combat. Such is our way. Such is the ancient custom of Skyrim and all lords. Cut him down. On this day, I go to Sovereign God. One could say that the execution of Rogvir was unjust on the basis that the arrest of Ulfric at this time would have been in spite of the law. However, on the flip side, a city guard's fealty would be to the city itself and its rulers, and hence he betrayed his duty by acting against the interest of the city. This is the dilemma we will come across constantly in this analysis. There is an ethical and a legalistic perspective to consider on both sides, but not only that, but we have several hierarchies and levels of fealty to consider, some more local and immediate, others broader, symbolic, and more idealistic. For Skyrim, at a more granular level, you have thanes, nobles that would be the equivalent to barons or lords of some sort. Typically, they would be land-owning individuals that wield some measure of political power and feel from house carls and such. The phrase untithed to any thane in this source would indicate that in law, villages or towns would pay tithes to a thane, indicating that it is a role of nobility of sorts. As indicated by the gameplay of Skyrim, you can become thane as an honorary title, which comes with the privilege of purchasing property in the city. But I think typically the title of thane would come with feudal and administrative obligations. Also, I don't think people would just be collecting the thane titles like Pokemon from every hold like you can in the game. We must consider there will always be some disparity between player freedom and gameplay mechanics and the law of the world. Same as how there aren't literally 62 people living in solitude. Obviously, this is a game limitation compared to the law reality. A thane in our own real world history was essentially a noble given land for military service. So in Skyrim, thanes are your landed lords who were granted such titles by the Jarls to whom they swear fealty. The Jarls govern their own holds, such as Whiterun, Windhelm and whatnot, and they are typically hereditary roles. The Jarls take part in a moot, which is essentially a council where a high king is voted for, the high king to whom they all swear fealty. While there is an election, and theoretically any Jarl is a possible candidate. Typically, the son or daughter of the previous king is elected, as was the case with High King Torig succeeding his father Istlod. 
One could say that this is the traditional assumption outside of extenuating circumstances. Don't get it twisted, this isn't some democracy situation. In practice, it's more like the Jarls have the ability to elect a different High King if the successor is particularly terrible or if they die without an heir. The High King and his entire Kingdom of Skyrim is a vassal state of the Cyrodiilic Empire, which itself is a morass of noble ranks, bureaucracy, and an elder council headed by an emperor. And of course, we have the Thalmor interventions as per the White Gold Concordat, which was signed at the end of the Great War, determining the outlaw of Talos worship, and this gives them the right to have Justicia agents carry out witch hunts within Imperial territories, most specifically regarding the rooting out of Talos worshippers. In many ways, the Markarth incident, for which Ulfric was responsible, allowed the Thalmor to advance their intervention, as they claimed the Empire was not making sure its vassals were upkeeping the terms of the treaty. More on that later. But it's a right mess of feudal obligations, imperial law, Nordic custom, and conflicting ideals, and plenty of argument as to which should take precedence. After the killing of High King Torrig and the escape of Ulfric Stormcloak from Solitude, Skyrim was torn asunder, with the eastern portion, that is the old holds of the Pale, Winterhold, Eastmarch, and the Rift, all united with Ulfric Stormcloak in a war for independence. The western half of Skyrim, the holds of Hafingar, Hjolmark, Falkreath, and the Reach remained loyal to the Empire. Jarl Balgroff the Greater, Lord of Whiterun Hold, tried to maintain some sense of neutrality at the onset of this strife, but eventually, when pressed, he maintained his obligation to the Empire. Ulfric was captured a few months after his killing of Torrig, explained from the perspective of Hadvar, the Imperial soldier, at the beginning of the game. A masterstroke by General Tullius. He's only been in charge here for a few months, but he's turned things around for the Empire. We've been trying to catch Ulfric since the war started, but he always seemed to slip through our fingers, like he knew we were coming. This time, the General turned the tables on him. Ulfric rode right into our ambush with only a few bodyguards. He surrendered pretty meekly too. So much for his death or glory reputation. I thought we were taking Ulfric back to Cyrodiil, but I guess the general changed his mind. You know the rest. All right, done. The general political landscape is laid out. We're all on the same page with the immediate context of the Civil War. Since this event is called the Stormcloak Rebellion, it seems only fitting that we dive into the Stormcloak perspective first. On the face of it, the Stormcloak Rebellion is a war for independence from the Empire, due to their belief in its cowardice and oppression, particularly its religious oppression via their compliance with the Old Mary Dominion and the outlaw of Talos worship. For the Stormcloak, this is an existential crisis. Not only has the Empire fallen from its former glory, but the Old Mary Dominion, Elves, their most ancient enemy, threaten to eliminate the very god that bonds the Empire and the Nords. I guess that wasn't such a big deal elsewhere in the Empire, but here it's caused a lot of resentment. Native son and all that. Even I'll admit it hasn't been the Empire's finest hour. But it wasn't like the Emperor had any choice, did he? If he hadn't signed the peace treaty with the Thalmor, they would have destroyed the Empire. Then where would Skyrim be? That's the part that Ulfric supporters always conveniently forget about. Unless the Empire stands together, the Thalmor will destroy us all. Many in the Empire have a practical reasoning for compliance in the meantime, while they prepare for the proposed inevitable second conflict with the Old Mary Dominion. However, to pull a cool quote from the movie Kingdom of Heaven, When you stand before God, you cannot say, but I was told by others to do thus, or that virtue was not convenient at the time. This will not suffice. Remember that. When you consider the cultural values of honor, keeping to your word, fighting for your kin, all while hoping to prove yourself to feast in the halls of Sovngarde, it's easy to understand why the Stormcloaks take issue with this practical abandoning of virtue, Talos worship, for the sake of material advantage. A lot of the difference between the Imperial and Stormcloak perspective comes down to a more idealistic, spiritual, customary approach versus a more practical, political approach. The problem with either side is that the Stormcloaks may be so idealistic and adherent to customs and matters of faith that they forego the achievable advantages against the Old Mary Dominion. Yet the Imperials face sacrificing their very identity for the sake of temporal advantage, and in a world with tangible gods, the virtue of your soul is quite quite important. 
Again, just to reiterate, when a Stormcloak says gutless Imperial, they are viewing an empire that capitulated to the elves and sold out the most critically important god. You could approximate it to something like the president of the USA burning the American flag on live TV because of a new deal with China, or crusaders renouncing Christ for some practical advantage. This is the gravity of the situation. Those of you invested in the lore may have delved into the mysteries and heresies surrounding the figure of Talos Stormcrown, aka Tiber Septum, aka the Ninth Divine. We will not be diving into this kind of material here because quite simply, it's irrelevant to the orthodox beliefs of Talos that were shared by both the Nords and the Imperials for centuries, with the Empire having only changed their official position 26 years prior to the events of the game Skyrim. The orthodox position, which the Stormcloaks and, secretly, many Imperials hold, is that Talos is Tiber Septum, the Empire's founder, ascended to godhood. He was born in Atmora, prophesied by the Greybeards, he was master of the Thorm, and through his greatness, he refounded the Empire of Cyrodiil, and for the first time in history, all of Tamriel was united in its glory. For his feats in life, he ascended to godhood, welcomed among the gods, and became the ninth divine of the Imperial Pantheon. His bloodline ruled as emperors of the Septim Empire for all the Third Era until it ended with the sacrifice of Martin Septim. After the Stormcrown Interregnum, the Mead dynasty seized power and continued to preserve this legacy. Talos was heralded as the Ninth Divine and God of the Empire until the Great War ended with the signing of the White Gold Concordat. Since then, he is regarded officially as just a man, not a god. To the Stormcloaks, this is not only a betrayal of a shared legacy with the Empire, but also to jump into bed with the most ancient of enemies, those damn elves. It's a religious matter. The Thormor do not recognize Talos as a god. He was only a man and does not deserve a place in our pantheon. The Empire has agreed to accept our beliefs and its citizens have a responsibility to cease their heretical worship. To really understand the heart of the Stormcloak Rebellion, we want to go way back into history and understand the foundational elements of Nordic society. I'll try to be brief, so forgive me for not addressing every drop of nuance. I'm merely trying to show the historical perspective which informs their cultural worldview. In the oldest myths, the Nordic gods led by the chieftain Shor, also known as Lorcan by the elves, fought the elven gods on behalf of men. Shor was slain and became the god of the underworld, and in death, Nords will go to rest in his halls, in Sovngarde. Foundationally, Nords already have a distaste for elves. Through much of their folklore, this much is apparent, but even historically, this precedent is found over and over. Isgrimor and his 500 companions, as well as their descendants, essentially wiped out the Snow Elves from the face of Skyrim in retaliation for the Night of Tears. Important side note here, Isgrimor also founded the city of Windhelm, which became the capital of Skyrim for its early history, which is symbolically relevant for a Nordic revival at the hands of Ulfric Stormcloak, current Jarl of Windhelm. This too is why Ulfric would seek to reclaim the Jagged Crown, as it is an ancient symbol of kings used by the dynasty of Isgrimor. These symbolic appeals and reverence for ancient customs and traditions are both useful for morale and help legitimize a movement seeking to return to the old ways, back when things were based and Nord pilled. Throughout the first centuries of the First Era, Skyrim's holdings expanded dramatically with the First Empire of the Nords, fighting and conquering lands of Kaima, Dwemer, and Aelids, as well as those ruled by Dreni Elves in the West. They found the races of man crushed and subjugated by elven rule or proliferation, most certainly was the case with the situation in Cyrodiil. It was with the instrumental support of Nordic armies from Skyrim that made the Elysian Rebellion against their Aelid slave masters as successful as it was. Even this far back in history, the fates of the Nords and the Nidic inhabitants of Cyrodiil, who would later be blanket termed as Imperials, were intertwined. In fact, the very formation of the Eight Divines was conceptualized by the slave queen Alicia, who sought to make a form of worship acceptable to both the old Merry God worshipping former slaves and the Nords. Hence, we end up with Stendar instead of Stun, Julianos instead of Junal, so on and so forth. The Nords have been deeply intertwined with the history of Cyrodiil since the earliest centuries of the First Era. Over 2,000 years later, with the rise of the Riemann Empire, the Nords too would pledge themselves to the Emperor early on. 
The Nords mostly remained staunch in their veneration of their own Nordic gods for most of history, Kine, Stun, Short, Sun, etc. But the coming of Talos Stormcrown changed things. After the Riemann Empire had fallen, and again Tamriel was thrust into disarray, it was this Talos, hailing from Atmora, that rekindled the ashes and forged the greatest empire Tamriel has ever seen. Izmir, a name he was known by in the North, became the divine champion of man and empire to the Nords. And this shared cultural heritage that Talos had with the Nords more than any other time bonded the Nords and the Cyrodiils. By the time of Skyrim, we see that the Imperial Pantheon has become the dominant religion, with most Nordic elements sufficiently imperialized. Some Nords on the fringes of society worship the Nordic gods, kind over Kinnereth type thing, unsullied by southern influence, but this is not the norm and clearly has not been for some time. In some ways, we could say that Talos took the place of Shor, a champion god of man, the ideal king, chief, emperor, god. Nords respect strength and leadership, they value war and conquest, and in the Empire they find both spiritual leadership in Talos as well as conquest and war in his imperial expansions that encompassed all of Tamriel. This may be a little speculation on my part, but consider also that historically, Nords have been troubled by the idea of worshipping a dragon time god, considering its ancient associations with Alduin. So perhaps with the apotheosis of Tiber Septimus Talos, they had a god of the Empire that they could comfortably bond to, one more familiar to their cultural values. A conquering Nordic warlord with a powerful thumb. Which in the end helped them adopt Imperial virtues more strongly throughout the Third and Fourth Eras. I've often seen the argument around, and perhaps in former years even parroted, why don't the Nords just worship their old gods? Talos is an imperial god. But I think this is a simplification. Talos, Tiber Septim, the very Septim Empire, all have fundamental ties with Nordic society, and for centuries the entity that is Talos, whether under the name of Izmir or not, has been venerated by the Nords. So to relate this all to the Civil War itself, the Stormcloak movement is not anti-imperialist in the sense that it opposes the Empire on principle or that it even despises anything imperial. They have shared heritage with Cyrodiil that has bonded them for centuries, if not thousands thousands of years. It is an argument of corruption, a lack of honourable virtue. If the Empire had given the finger to the White Gold Concordat and continued on fighting, a war that they possibly could have won, then there wouldn't be a peep from the Nords of Skyrim. Many Stormcloaks fought in the Great War as Imperial soldiers against the Old Merry Dominion and were understandably in its aftermath disenfranchised with the very Empire it bled for, because conceding so greatly as to outlaw worship of the very founding god of their Empire was cowardice and weakness, all of which proved to them how far the Empire had fallen. They bargained away the paragon of their identity in the Empire. And in truth, I can't blame them for this sentiment. Fighting, dying, bleeding for your emperor only to have them turn around and slap you in the face and send you home impoverished would be one of the greatest betrayals imaginable. Discovering that the empire you believed in does not exist, and not only that, but you are also further made to sacrifice your faith and live in a land subject to witch hunts for breaking it, it would be a terrible thing. And the cherry on top of all of this is that it's because of those damn elves. We're fighting because we're done bleeding for an empire that won't bleed for us. Untold numbers of Nords died defending the empire against the Dominion. And for what? Skyrim being sold to the Thalmor so the Emperor could keep his throne. We're fighting because our own Jarls, once strong, wise men, have become fearful and blind to the people's suffering. We're fighting because Skyrim needs heroes, and there's no one else but us. So we have a pretty good understanding of the Stormcloak position, but let's have a little deep dive into this man's history and his motivations. Very relevant, I would say, considering he is the face of the Rebellion, and certainly would be High King if victorious. Obviously, the most common criticism I see levied at Ulfric, both from the Elder Scrolls community and characters in-game, is that he is an egomaniac who just wants power for the sake of it and I generally disagree with his assessment. While it can almost be certain that he fancies himself the savior of Skyrim, and he most certainly wants power to achieve his ends, I doubt he is this charlatan egomaniac type character he gets painted as by some. By this I mean he is truly invested in the ideals he fights for, and isn't just carrying political calling cards for the sake of acquiring power and then doing away with them when it's convenient. 
let's go back in time and see what shaped the man of today. His father, Hoag Stormcloak, the Bear of Eastmarch, was the Jarl of Windhelm and the head of the Stormcloak clan. Of his son, Ulfric Stormcloak, little is known until the Markarth incident, but we can piece together bits from dialogues. I personally suspect that Ulfric was not the immediate heir. Perhaps he had elder brothers, perhaps those that died in the Great War. The reason for this is that he was initially meant to become a Greybeard. I studied with them when I was young. They taught me how to shout. Yes, they chose me when I was just a lad. It was a great honor, of course. I was to become a Greybeard myself. I spent almost ten years at High Hrothgar, learning the way of the voice. Then the Great War came. I couldn't stand missing it. I often think about High Hrothgar. It's very disconnected from the troubles down here. But that's why I couldn't stay, and why I couldn't go back. I suppose the Greybeards care about Skyrim's troubles in their way, but I needed to do something about it. I'm sure Angir would call it one of my failings. Ulfric, when questioned about his ability to shout, says the following. Yes, although I rarely use my training. The Greybeards believe the voice should be used only for worship of Kinnereth. I have fallen from their strict teaching. But I still don't feel it should be used lightly. Not all of Angir's lecturing was wasted, it seems. It's a beautiful philosophy, but outside the seclusion of High Hrothgar, I was never able to hold to it. So, a rarity among the Nords of today, Ulfric was taught to use the Thorn by the Greybeards, and if you ever pick a fight with him, you can see he knows how to shout well. Almost ten years of training with the Greybeards in his youth, he says, and while there are many estimations and attempted calculations of his exact age by the time of Skyrim, personally, I really can't see Ulfric as older than 50. I'd even be willing to say closer to mid-40s. I see some saying 60, and man, he must have the best skincare routine in Tamriel if that's the case. But either way, Way, all we can use are the numbers. My estimation is that he would be something like 8 to 12 when he was chosen to go to the Greybeards. Let's just say 10. So with near 10 years with the Greybeards before he left to fight in the Great War, he's probably just shy of 20 in 171, which would make him exactly 50 now. Anywho, Ulfric Stormcloak felt he had to enter the Great War, and I'd even be willing to believe that he had immediate family that were also in the fight, perhaps an elder brother or brothers, maybe even cousins. Again, the reason I believe that he had brothers, and this is just a guess, is because Jarls don't usually send their one and only heir off to be a monk on a mountain. The Great War rages on for four to five years, between the years 171 and 175. We know that he also fought alongside Galmar Stonefist, who is his loyalist supporter till this day, but also Legate Ricca, a Nordic woman and right hand of General Tullius. If one sided with the Stormcloaks and makes the assault on Solitude, the interaction indicates their shared past. Ulfric, stop. Stop what? Taking Skyrim back from those who leave her to rot. You're wrong, Ulfric. We need the Empire. Without it, Skyrim will assuredly fall to the Dominion. You were there with us. You saw it. The day the Empire signed that damn treaty was the day the Empire died. You're a damn fool. Stand aside, woman. We've come for the General. He has given up, but I have not. Rekka, go. You're free to leave. I'm also free to stay and fight for what I believe in. You're also free to die for it. This is what you wanted? Shield brothers and sisters killing each other? Families torn apart? This is the Skyrim Damn it, woman, you stand want? aside! That's not the Skyrim I want to live in. Rika, you don't have to do this. You've left me no choice. Talos, preserve us. That's a little sad, but what is sadder is what happened during the Great War to the young Ulfric. We now take the most controversial document about Ulfric, one that I think is often misconstrued or misinterpreted. This is the Thalmor dossier on Ulfric Stormcloak, but before we read, we should define what is meant by an asset in this context. 
An asset does not mean aligned with or subordinate to, it is merely a useful or valuable thing or person. So in this context, Ulfric is an uncooperative asset, aka an asset to the Thalmor interests by virtue of keeping Imperial resources tied up in fighting a civil war, but not as in Ulfric is doing this for the Thalmor cause. The Thalmor seemingly excel at manipulation and clandestine activities, as evidenced by their ascension to power and their successive coups and captures of elsewhere in Valenwood. They were also able to thwart the Blades, the Imperial Intelligence, at near every turn. But just to refocus on the tragedy of Ulfric here. Ulfric first came to our attention during the first war against the Empire, when he was taken as prisoner of war during the campaign for the White Gold Tower. Under interrogation, we learned of his potential value, son of the Jarl of Windhelm, and he was assigned as an asset to the interrogator, who is now First Emissary Elenwen. He was made to believe information obtained during his interrogation was crucial in the capture of the Imperial City. The city had in fact fallen before he had broken, and then allowed to escape. After the war, contact was established, and he has proven his worth as an asset. The so-called Markarth Incident was particularly valuable from the point of view of our strategic goals in Skyrim, although it resulted in Ulfric becoming generally uncooperative to direct contact. A young man captured in war and broken by Thalmor interrogation led to believe that it was his information that brought about the Imperial City's capture. In truth, it wasn't, but Ulfric did, and possibly does still, believe this was so though perhaps he was given context after his escape. I've spoken on the channel about this before, but I do believe that this deep hidden shame of Ulfric is one of the factors that contributes to his fiery zealousness, a sense of righteousness born of his shame, breaking under interrogation. Perhaps a feeling of needing to make things right and atone. We have to remember at this time, he hasn't flipped on the empire yet. And as mentioned in the dialogue of Galmar, Ricker, and Ulfric, they were all there at the signing of the White Gold Concordat, which implies Ulfric, after his escape, rejoined the war effort and was probably present at the Battle of the Red Ring, the climactic end battle of the war and retaking of the Imperial City. But it was at this moment that faith in the Empire was shaken for Ulfric. There is one troublesome line in this dossier that says, after the war, contact was established and he has proven his worth as an asset. Now, proven worth as an asset is simply he has proven valuable to the Thalmor cause insofar as he stirs up anti-imperial sentiment from within and eventually an all-out rebellion. But the words contact established at first might make you think that Thalmor agents came to him and told him what to do. But I think this is wrong for all the obvious reasons at how antithetical this is to his person. I see no way in which Ulfric, after escaping the Thalmor, then continuing to fight them for the remainder of the Great War, all of a sudden becomes a Thalmor secret agent. This contact is most likely referring to Thalmor operatives, like double agents, establishing relations or communication with him. So, for example, a double agent in his court, a steward or some noble, paid to relay information of the ongoings in his life to the Thalmor, where then the Thalmor assess and pay these paid informants to nudge or influence his decision making. Classic espionage. We'll dive deeper into the Thalmor goals and perspective later, so this dossier will come up again. But the indecisive civil war, the season unending if you will, is an advantage the Thalmor seek. But of course, as is evidenced by the events of the game, not a goal that Ulfric is interested in, nor complicit with. The last line of the dossier explicitly states, a Stormcloak victory is also to be avoided, however, so even indirect aid to the Stormcloaks must be carefully managed. But let's circle back to the biography of Ulfric. Feels bad, man. He was captured, tortured, made to believe this info helped the Thalmor take the city, ashamed of breaking, continued to fight in the war, White Gold Concordat is signed, Talos worship outlawed, feels betrayed along with thousands of others, then heads home to Skyrim. During the years 174 to 176, while the Empire was busy with the Great War, the Forsworn Uprising was successful and Markarth became a Reachman-ruled kingdom for two years. Historically, what followed would be known as the Markarth Incident, and this was the second event in in Ulfric's life that would turn him against the Empire. It is what ignited the Stormcloak movement. It all started here, this rebellion. When the Empire lost the Reach during the Great War, we became desperate. We promised a group of Nord militia free worship in exchange for their help retaking the Hold. Then the Elves found out about it. We were forced to arrest all of them. Ulfric Stormcloak, their leader, used the whole thing as proof that the Empire had abandoned Skyrim. The rebels called it 
the Markarth Incident. It was the founding day for the Stormcloaks and where this war really started. He says twice for Ulfric that he had been betrayed by the Empire. The Bear of Markarth was thrown in jail. My father, the Great Bear of Eastmarch, died during my imprisonment after the Markarth Incident. I, his only son, forced to deliver his eulogy via letter I had smuggled out of prison. Such is the love of Titus Mead for his subjects. When finally set free, I returned to Windhelm and was greeted by a city in mourning. At one with my own grief and anger, clamoring in angry voices, calling out for justice, for war, they sat me on the throne. The throne of Isgomor, the throne of my father. I only hope I can prove worthy of that honor. How long this sentence was is unknown exactly, but there is some 25 years between the Markarth incident and the present day, so it could have been quite some time. Unfortunately, I don't think we can get the details. However, he was Jarl of Windhelm during the reign of High King Istlod, and we can assume that Ulfric had been a political agitator for many years, because as Sibyl Stentor says about the moot to elect a new High King, No, even after Istlod died, the moot voted to make Torig High King of Skyrim. But Ulfric was at that moot, continually talking about Skyrim's independence in terms just shy of treason. I don't think Ulfric knew how much Torg respected him for that. If Ulfric had asked Torg directly to stand up, to declare independence, Torg might have done it. Then of course, Ulfric later challenged Torig, killed him, and the whole civil war officially started. So that is a recap of the life of Ulfric, and one can understand where all of his motivations come from. Seemingly from a young age, he has had a great respect for duty and his people. He clearly, actually cares about Skyrim and is willing to die for it. I think to claim otherwise is a false representation of his character, no matter how misguided you may think he is. Funnily enough, I would think that the shame of not living up to an honorable standard when he was tortured and gave up information as a young man actually made him double down on a more zealous attitude in an attempt to atone for his secret shame. I won't deny that there are elements of his character that hint at a kind of savior syndrome where only he can bring Skyrim onto the true path. A bit of a with me or against me attitude, my way or the highway, as evidenced by the ultimatum delivered to Whiterun, or by his brutal treatment of the Forsworn at Markarth, and according to Imperial scholars, it was also Nords who opposed him and received brutal treatment as well. Though I suppose we must account for bias there. Still, I think it is a fair assessment of his character. He has been shown to adhere to customs, such as the case with the duel with Torig, and if you do win against the Empire, he respects the law and refuses to take the mantle of High King until he is elected by the Moot. But also, he does know he would be elected, in the same way he knew Torig would have to fight him and that he would kill him. The problem too with his zealous idealism as well as that of his followers is that it does not account for practical concerns, for after all, a zealot would rather die fighting or starve on their own terms rather than concede to tarnishing their soul by sacrificing their virtue for practical reasons. Regardless of the figurehead of the movement, or even elements of his character that may be considered distasteful, the ideals and goals of the Stormcloak Rebellion exist in the hearts and minds of many. We will address the problems of the faction in a few moments, but before that, after having been given the historical context and assessment of their leadership, we should break down and summarize somewhat what the faction stands for, the values shared by the majority of its adherents. The Stormcloaks stand for self-determination and independence from the Empire. They believe that the Empire has betrayed its very substance and feel that they can no longer respect nor tolerate its control. In essence, they are somewhat isolationist. Skyrim is for the Nords and the Nordic ways. And if the Empire won't respect the very god that bonded them with the Cyrodiils, then they won't respect the Empire, demanding their freedom from them. One of the arguments that Imperial supporters would say is that unity is important and you need to keep the fire burning to maintain the Empire. Talos's very creation needs to remain alive. However, on the flip side, if the Empire no longer resembles the thing it once was, by what right does it assert this justification? Consider that back in the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind, an avatar of Talos named Wolf says this about the Empire back then, that is over 200 years ago. The Emperor is getting old. Don't know how much longer he'll hang on. So is the whole Empire for that matter. Getting old, that is. The Emperor and the Legions have held the Empire together for hundreds of years. 
It's been a good thing by and large, but maybe it's time for a change. Time for something young and new. What? No idea, because I'm old. Old dog doesn't get new ideas. But maybe young folks like you should try some new ideas. I don't know. Could be messy, but change is never pretty. Perhaps based upon the words of this avatar, the Stormcloak Rebellion would be something admirable, the never pretty change that would bring a renewal for man. Maybe so. Consider the cycles of the Cyrodiilic powers, the rise and fall of empires, renewal. But I would not expand the Stormcloak's current aims that far as of yet. If you side with the Stormcloaks, Ulfric's speech indicates his path forward. There is much to do, and I need every able-bodied man and woman committed to rebuilding Skyrim. A great darkness is growing, and soon we will be called to fight it on these shores or abroad. The Old Mary Dominion may have defeated the Empire, but it has not defeated Skyrim! And after in private conversation with Galmar... I'm not afraid of the remnants of the Legion. In time, they'll all give up and go home. What I fear is that the Thalmor will see our victory here and turn greater attention to our shores. We must be prepared to face them. Aye. In summary, Stormcloaks are pro-Nord, pro-Skyrim, pro-Talos, and would rather die a man of principle than live a coward who sold out his ideals. But there are some very real problems. Firstly, idealism isn't going to fix everything. There are practical concerns voiced by several characters in the games. Things such as logistical issues, relying on Cyrodiil for resources, I imagine a lot of food, and also defensive issues. Many have stated that without an empire united with Skyrim, they won't be able to hold out against the Second Coming War. And from a practical perspective, I'd probably agree. Though we also have a situation where Skyrim is a northern backwater for all intents and purposes, with its rugged and inhospitable terrain. It's not exactly a key strategic spot for Old Mary Dominion conquest, I suppose. We also must consider that Hammerfell, who declared independence from the Empire at the White Gold Concordat, managed to eventually repel the Thalmor on their own. Perhaps a mutual defense pact between Skyrim and Hammerfell would be possible. A Dragon Star pact, if you will. Regardless, it seems a far more difficult struggle to fight the Old Mary Dominion and win as Skyrim standing on its own without the Empire. And if the Empire, along with Cyrodiil, were to fall, then they would have terrible problems ahead of them. It would be a hard road to go down. The other glaring problem has to do with racial tensions. Skyrim, having been part of a cosmopolitan empire, has its fair share of non-Nordic populations. And specifically in Windhelm, there is a large Dunma population, refugees and descendants of refugees. There are palpable tensions here, and such tensions can be found to lesser extents elsewhere in Skyrim. People such as this are unlikely to be invested in the Stormcloak's ideals of Skyrim, interested only in so far as it offers practical gains such as protection or material wealth and safety. I can imagine in a Stormcloak-controlled independent Skyrim, pro-Nord sentiments over all others would ignite even more. Problem for the Nords? Not really, but from an outside ethical perspective, yeah, you could say there's a big problem. Additionally, as is often the case with populist movements, it relies heavily on the particular leader. Ulfric Stormcloak is a champion of his people, a powerful symbol, true to the gods, wielder of the thumb, veteran, suffered for what is right, and he holds the throne of Isgrimmaur, plus in a victory scenario, he would wear the ancient jagged crown of kings. He is a poster child for Nordic nationalism. Yet if he were to die, even if he became High King and then later died, there isn't the same guarantee that his successor would spark the same flame. Ulfric is clearly a charismatic leader, and many will die on the front lines for his cause, but these kinds of leaders are rare, and in an event of his death, I would say there's a fair chance that the fire of Skyrim would quell with it. Even without his death, after the excitement and energy of rebellion cools, after Ulfric the High King begins rebuilding, you're likely to end up with a disappointment in the material conditions that they are left with, once the ecstatic blood haze fades. This path for the Nords is one wrought by great difficulty and will require constant morale boosting and charismatic leaders to help their people endure in spirit. One way to address this is to keep them busy, always pointed at the enemy, and thus perhaps this could lead to more aggression from Skyrim, perhaps towards the borders of Cyrodiil or Morrowind, maybe even High Rock or Hammerfell. 
Who knows? But raids pressured by the need to point galvanized warriors may be a reality, especially if they can be used to capture material resources. After all, leaders could always appeal to ancient Nordic traditions. Raiding and conquest are staple activities of Skyrim's history, after all. It is time to now address the opposing side, the Empire of Cyrodiil, colloquially termed Imperials. On precedence alone, the Empire has claimed to Skyrim. The lands of Skyrim have been united with Cyrodiil for well over six centuries, bonded brothers so much that at least for the last two centuries, we've seen Skyrim's Nordic culture significantly imperialize, today favoring the Imperial Divines over their more ancient and warlike Nordic gods of old, accepting what some would call pale imitations. So too has Skyrim become quite a cosmopolitan imperial province, with large local populations of outsiders that would have in eras past been more than unwelcome. The Jarls of the current day are much more like the Counts of Cyrodiil compared to the warlike chieftains of Skyrim's early days. None of this is necessarily a bad thing at all, especially if you happen to have pointy ears and call yourself an elf, but assuredly Skyrim's current culture is one that does share many values with the Empire. In fact, the main reason there has been a civil war is because of the Imperial denial of their very own cultural paragon, the denial of Talos's godhood. Fundamentally, the Imperial position is born out of practicality. The Great War was terribly devastating for the Empire. They even lost the very Imperial city at one point, epically retaking it later in a last-ditch effort to reclaim their capital, an event dubbed the Battle of the Red Ring. They were victorious, but at a great price. A Pyrrhic victory, if you will. Ultimately, the two sides of the Great War, the Empire and the Old Mary Dominion, agreed to a peace treaty, with two of the stipulations being the outlaw of Talos worship, state recognition that he is just a man, and also they had to cede southern portions of Hammerfell. Emperor Titus Mead II agreed to these terms, yet Hammerfell refused to give up their lands and therefore separated from the Empire and continued to fight against the Thalmor independently. These very practical concessions would theoretically allow for the Empire to rebuild and bolster their legions so they can prepare for what many of the upper echelons of society would consider an inevitable second war. It is a complicated issue, but with real ramifications and perhaps not satisfactory for those who are devout to one of, if not the most important god to the Third Empire. It's not like giving up your Nintendo Switch until the next school holidays. This is like giving up your faith or principles for decades. The current count of Talos worship being illegal is 26 years. And while there are many who would accept this and move on, the practical reasonings do not satisfy all, clearly given the rebellion. But I think diving into some of the historical context of the Empire will explain the situation more clearly clearly. I do want to touch on the notion of religion and state for a moment. In Western society, religion has been separated from state, so for us such concerns may seem strange, but this is not the case for most of history, and same with Tamriel's history. In fact, many states, kingdoms, and of course empires upon Nern draw upon religious or spiritual justifications for rule, such is certainly the case with the Empire. Tiber Septim conquered all, united all of Tamriel, wore the Amulet of Kings, became a god, Talos, and all of the successive emperors of the Septim dynasty were of his divine lineage. In fact, for the two empires preceding the third incarnation that exists today, the title of emperor has only been authenticated by the gods, that is, through the covenant with Akatosh and the Amulet of Kings. For thousands of years, the Amulet of Kings has been the symbol of the divinely ordained, and look, there's lots of metaphysical and mythological quackery one could get into, including how bloodlines and magical covenants won't exactly map onto a DNA-based genealogy that we know in our world, but for both the Elysian and Riemann empires, the Amulet of Kings, the Kim El Adabal as it is otherwise known, has been the authenticator of rule, proof of dragon blood, a kinship with Akatosh. The right to rule on Nern as emperor was divinely ordained. However, with Martin Septim's sacrifice at the end of the Third Era featured in the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion, the Amulet of Kings was destroyed. What followed was the stewardship of Potentate Okato for 15 years until he was assassinated, likely by Thalmor agents, resulting in the Stormcrown Interregnum, a war for the throne. Year 22 of the Fourth Era, after seven years of bloodshed, Titus Mead, a Clovian warlord, captures the Imperial City and is crowned the new Emperor of Tamriel. However, for the first time, 
time, there was not a divine instrument to affirm this right, and hence the precedence for the imperial seat was no longer justified by divine covenant. The Mede dynasty did however uphold the worship of Talos, and their identity was found in the continuation of the Septim Empire, perhaps as the caretakers of the Septim legacy. So one could say that one of the last authenticators of legitimacy in the eyes of the heavens and of the empire's citizens would be found in the commitment to upholding such a legacy. However, the legal, official denial of Talos as a god, foregoing the very founder of the legacy you intend to protect, is quite simply not a good look. This again is where we run into the virtue versus practicality dilemma, but arguably to forego the very legitimizing essence of their institution seriously undermines their legitimacy as an heir of the imperial legacy, which could and has led to many turning away from the empire, believing it a shadow of its former self. It also depends on which part of the empire you are from. If you are in Cyrodiil, it would perhaps be easier to accept this change, because beyond spiritual or cultural affinity, your local existence is dependent on a strong state but it is a much harder sell in the provinces, especially those like Skyrim who have essentially had the linchpin of their spiritual brotherhood severed. They are also far enough away from the potential theatre of war that they could become an isolationist kingdom, leaving broader Tamriel to their own devices. None of the characters in game, even the Jarls, Legates and Generals aligned with the Imperials voice support of the White Gold Concordat on virtuous grounds. It all has to do with practical reasoning, being able to win the coming second war with the Old Merry Dominion. If I'm sounding a little hard on the Empire, I don't think I'm being so, rather just calling it as it is, because on the face of it, the Empire has a lot going for it, again, practically. But while we are in the realm of historical context, let's talk about how historically the Empire has been beneficial to Tamriel as a whole. Trade, infrastructure, wealth, guilds, political stability, security, laws, arts, cultural commonality, even bureaucracy, which while often derided because it can become overly bloated and tied up with red tape, is actually a good thing. The very existence of this is to provide checks and balances on power, as well as impart fairness with a complex legalistic tradition, affording protections, rights, etc. But let's not also forget that this is still an empire in a fantasy setting. We still have things like guilty until proven innocent as standard imperial law. But all legal proceedings across Tamriel, by modern standards, are likely to be questionable. Death penalties, poor prison conditions, etc. and so forth. So that can't really be a mark against the Empire when comparing to the rest of Tamriel. I don't imagine, from what we have seen in Skyrim, that their application of justice is particularly appealing to modern sensibilities either. In all likelihood, it is far worse than the Empire. We are, after all, talking about a culture where a Jarl could just challenge the High King to a duel and kill him lawfully or at least according to their custom. Anyways, it would be fair to say that living in Tamriel under the reign of the Septim Empire would probably have been the best time in history, but arguably, by the time of the Mede Dynasty, it's a bit more of a mixed bag, especially with the whole Great War business. Let's talk about the leaders of this side of the conflict. Naturally, this means Emperor Titus Mede II and the Provincial Governor of Skyrim, General Tullius. The Emperor Titus Mede II famously led his people against the Old Merry Dominion in the Great War, yet he was also the one to concede to the terms of the White Gold Concord. It. Heavy weighs the crown and all that. He had only been emperor for three years before he was thrust into the Great War, which ended with this ultimatum. Being in his position at that moment would have been incredibly difficult. The fact the White Gold Concordat was even an option was a miracle. The Battle of the Red Ring was far from a guaranteed victory. I think you or I can at the very least empathize with Titus Mede and his conundrum. Does he accept the terms of the Thalmor, play it safe and use that chance to rebuild despite the issues that it would cause, or does he take an all already exhausted and depleted empire and try to fight to victory against the odds once more. We know the decision he made. Although victorious, the Imperial armies were in no shape to continue the war. The entire remaining Imperial force was gathered in Cyrodiil, exhausted and decimated by the Battle of the Red Ring. Not a single legion had more than half its soldiers fit for duty. Two legions had been effectively annihilated, not counting the loss of the Eighth during the retreat from the Imperial city the previous year. 
Titus II knew that there would be no better time to negotiate peace, and late in the fourth era, year 175, the Empire and the Old Mary Dominion signed the White Gold Concordat, ending the Great War. The terms were harsh, but Titus believed that it was necessary to secure peace and give the Empire a chance to regain its strength. The two most controversial terms of the Concordat were the banning of the worship of Talos and the cession of a large section of Southern Hammerfell, most of what was already occupied by Old Mary forces. Critics have pointed out that the Concordat is almost identical to the ultimatum the Emperor rejected five years earlier. However, there is a great difference between agreeing to such terms under the mere threat of war and agreeing to them at the end of a long and destructive war. No part of the Empire would have accepted these terms in 171, dictated by the Thalmor at Swords Point. Titus would have faced civil war. By 175, most of the Empire welcomed peace at almost any price. It would not only be the most pragmatic option, but also the most empathetic. At this point, it had been five years of Cyrodiil's ravaging, of the Empire's bleeding, countless citizens' lives lost, countless men and women lost on the battlefield, mothers and sons, fathers and daughters. Titus Mede ultimately chose peace and healing. The suffering had to end. The most zealous of soldiers and champions of Talos may feel betrayed, but while the spiritual and religious domain of life is important to many, Titus had to make the decision to consider the material present life of his people, even if this came at the cost of their legitimacy in the eyes of many. When compared to one such as Ulfric, Titus can't afford to die on this one singular hill of Talos worship because his cares are for an empire spanning provinces rather than just a singular culture or place like Skyrim. And arguably, for many under the empire, Talos would not be the most important thing. Talos has a uniquely important position to the Nords. Like I said, he's the linchpin that connects Skyrim to Cyrodiil culturally. Redguards, Dunmar, or Bretons, for example, would not necessarily attach to the Empire culturally for this same reason. The very interesting component of Titus Me II is that we know his fate, and it is one to consider for the future of Tamriel. As far as canon goes, each of the guild questlines have been treated as such. It's never been explicitly stated that the Hero of Kavach or the Nerevarine did them, but the idea is that the canon is kept this way so it doesn't conflict with your personal experience. For example, it is canon that the Grey Fox stole an Elder Scroll, or that Lucian Lachance died, or that Umaril is defeated by the Knights of the Nine, so on and so forth, but it isn't 100% your particular hero of Kvatch. It's really only the main stories that are attributed to them explicitly. So, it's reasonable to believe that for the Elder Scrolls VI, each of the guild questlines will be fulfilled in canon, meaning that the Eye of Magnus is taken by the Sigic Monks, Mercer Frey is killed, and the Skeleton Key returned to Nocturnal, that the Silver Hand are defeated, and the Soul of Kodlak freed from Hercine's grasp, and following this logic, the listener of the Dark Brotherhood would have successfully assassinated Emperor Titus Mede II while aboard his ship, the Cataria, in the bay at Solitude. So, the Emperor's death is a canon event, and seemingly, this was a contract arranged by a member of the Elder Council, Amand Mottier, and likely other co-conspirators within Imperial Governance. In the year 3E41, Emperor Pelagius Septim was murdered in the Temple of the One in the Imperial City, cut down by a Dark Brotherhood assassin. His killing ushered in, shall we say, a necessary change in Imperial policy. There are those now who wish for a similar change. I am sorry, but that's all I'm at liberty to say. While I've touched on this before, there are several complications regarding the directness of the Septim bloodline. As you can see, Empress Legius Septim was the successor to Tiber Septim, his grandson. What Omand is trying to imply is that the Dark Brotherhood were hired by the Elder Council or some form of shadow government that did not want Pelagius as ruler and hence Pelagius' first cousin once removed, the daughter of Tiber Septim's brother, Agnareth, was crowned Empress Kintyra Septim and the rest of the bloodline comes from there. Which is an oddity, the Septim dynasty doesn't come from Tiber Septim's balls as such, unless there were cousin intermarriages points. Anyways, that's a whole other topic to unpack. The point is, back then, Elder Council favoured another for Regency, and they used the Dark Brotherhood to do the deed. And it would seem that this is the case once again. Only problem is that we have very little insight on potential heirs. We can assume Titus Mead had children and grandchildren, but it'd all be speculation as to who they are and what their characteristics are. However, indicated by the actions of Mottier and his co-conspirators, the heir must be favourable to their machinations. What exactly are those machinations? I don't quite know. We can only really guess. I know, I know! I received the news not moments ago. Ha <laughs> ha! This is glorious! 
My friend, you may not realize it, but you have served the Empire. Indeed, all of Tamriel in ways you cannot possibly imagine. Ah, but you care little for politics, am I right? You want money, and money you shall have. Perhaps there is a desire to escalate hostilities with the old Merry Dominion and return worship of Talos, reforge an alliance with Hammerfell and such, but perhaps Titus Mead, given his past, has vetoed and suppressed such ideas for fear of entering the horror of a great war again by which he is traumatized. But the opposite is also possibly true, though based on the tone of Omon's dialogue, I find less likely. Perhaps the Elder Council wants to maintain the status quo and peace, and perhaps Titus Mead II, with all the empires preparing for the inevitable Second Great War, was getting a little antsy and was ready to cap off his rule with a redemption arc. It's all speculation, but as for certainty, we know that he is assassinated and this will cause some kind of transition for the Empire. During the actual Civil War questline in Skyrim, we have no interaction with the Emperor and it's General Tullius, appointed military governor of Skyrim, sent to quell the rebellion. Ulfric Stormcloak, some here in Helgen call you a hero. But a hero doesn't use a power like the voice to murder his king and usurp his throne. You started this war, plunged Skyrim into chaos, and now the Empire is going to put you down and restore the peace. On the face of it, General Tullius is just that, a military governor here to do the job. He is a soldier and commander, a proven tactician and loyal servant of the Empire. Throughout the questline, he is shown as characteristically practical and at odds with Nordic traditions and sensibilities. On the other hand, he also refuses to acknowledge Ulfric's claim. Well, if he wants to stand outside the protection of the Empire, fine. Let Ulfric pillage his city. General. You people and your damn Jarls. Sir, you can't force a Nord to accept help he hasn't asked for. If Ulfric's making a move for Whiterun, then we need to be there to stop him. Draft another letter with the usual platitudes, but this time share some of your intelligence regarding Ulfric's plans. Embellish if you have to. We'll let it seem like it's his idea. Yes, sir. You Nords and your bloody sense of honor. Clearly, General Talia seems to be a little salty with his position, having to navigate the stubborn traditions and ideals of the Nords. Even at the very end of the questline, he shows he has made very little attempt to understand Nordic culture. Any last requests before I send you to... to wherever you people go when you die? Sovngarde, sir. Right. Look, we can't really expect him to care for it. He's an Imperial General, his allegiance is first and foremost to the Empire, to Cyrodiil, but don't make the mistake of underestimating his heart. If you do find him in the Thalmor Embassy while sided with the Legion, he will say this. Which goes to show that even within the highest ranks, there is dissatisfaction with how things are, especially regarding cooperation with the Thalmor. Even before his death at the end of the questline, he voices that this is what the Thalmor would have wanted, to divide and conquer, to stir up trouble and divert Imperial resources to quelling a rebellion. We've spoken about the Emperor, the Elder Council, and Tullius. I think we can summarize the values and goals of the Empire before we get into some of the main problems. Above all, the Empire is committed to the preservation of law and order. For the last two centuries, they have, despite no longer having the dragon blood to rule them, desperately tried to preserve the legacy of the Septum Dynasty with varying levels of success. Ultimately, the Empire brings unity, shared culture, and thousands of logistical benefits that are often forgotten about, such as security, construction of roads, facilitated trade along roads, roads made safe by them, you have the Guilds Act facilitating the formation of guilds and the various occupations and education opportunities that they provide, as well as unified voices for the interests of those trades and occupations in order to ensure fair treatment. In law terms as well, we must consider that Nibine and more broadly Cyrodiil is considered an agricultural powerhouse, it being a fertile river basin which feeds the most populous city in the world, that is the imperial city at the center of Lake Rumare. Beyond all these logistical differences, the Empire has and still does afford cosmopolitan values and integrations of vastly different cultures underneath a single governing body, making a common law accessible to all within its purview. This often means that states with the usual inability to interact because of racial or cultural tensions, say Morrowind and Black Marsh for example, are forced to interact in peaceful manners because of the Empire's law, hence theoretically violence is off the table, therefore peace for the most part prevails. I have made the case that Talos is emblematic of the Third Empire, as both its 
founding emperor and god. But you could argue that the imperial ideals, an imperium of man if you will, exists beyond this most recent incarnation. The idea of a state, one of security and law, one of peace, is an ideal that exists independent of Talos, independent of divinely ordained emperors via the Amulet of Kings. In theory, this is possible. The problem is you end up without a convincing argument for one particular ruler over another, other than power and influence of the day, as the Mede dynasty currently has. Mutual interest and alliance are the biggest factors in the Empire's favour in the current day, more specifically in preparation for a second coming war with the Old Merry Dominion, but I suppose that is a hard sell to say the people of Hammerfell and Skyrim. The biggest problems I foresee with the Empire itself is trust and legitimacy. The track record of the last 30 years has been relatively dismal in these regards. The White Gold Concordat has essentially cost the Empire Hammerfell, who were most certainly justified in being furious, as the treaty called for them to cede the southern portions of their country, to which the Red Guards declined, and to maintain the treaty, the Empire essentially had to cut ties with Hammerfell and leave them to fend for themselves. And of course, the outlaw of Talos worship shook confidence in the legitimacy of the Empire, most specifically in the eyes of the Nords, which then of course leads to the Stormcloak Rebellion. Even in a season unending scenario, you must realise that the holdings of the Empire are essentially Cyrodiil, the western half of Skyrim, and then High Rock. If they were to lose western Skyrim to the Stormcloak Rebellion, supply lines by land to High Rock would be severed, leaving them with sea lanes only to High Rock, one path from Anvil, which is a bad spot to be blockaded, and ships sailing out from there could be intercepted by Dominion Navy, or in a peacetime situation, the Dominion could pay gold for pirates to attack Imperial ships. The only other sea lane is from Leowen through the Topol Bay and east, circumventing Black Marsh, Morrowind, and what would now be considered a hostile Skyrim under Stormcloak rule. So the Empire's subjects, given what happened to Hammerfell and clearly what is happening in Skyrim, simply do not have the trust in the Empire to look out for them. Unfortunately for the Regent Dynasty of the Medes, they don't even have an appeal to divine appointment, because they have no Dragonborn blood. There is no Amulet of Kings, no Light of the Dragonfires. They are simply the descendants of a Colovian warlord who seized power and were legitimized insofar as they protected the Septim legacy. Their greatest appeal is most certainly the shared enemy of the Thalmor, but who is to say they would not capitulate again if the situation looked just as dire? Even now they cooperate and let Justicia agents and Thalmor diplomats nest themselves in all corners of their bureaucracy. Don't think that this is bias either. I'm a huge fan of the Empire and their rich mythologies and traditions, but you have to admit that faith in the Empire is a very hard sell to anyone outside of Cyrodiil, especially based on the last two centuries. If you're an Imperial living in Cyrodiil, it's an easy sell, but not because you have faith in the concept of an Empire, merely because it's your local culture and governance and its existence is important for your survival. From a practical perspective, however, I think the provinces stand to lose a lot if they part from the Empire. Resources, safety, infrastructure, law and order, so on and so forth. The pragmatic reasons are a plenty. It will often just come down to a matter of trust and legitimacy, or rather an opposition based on virtuous or principled grounds. We've laid out a ton of perspectives and analysis on both the Empire and the Stormcloaks who are the main players of the conflict in Skyrim. However, I would be remiss to mention the Old Merry Dominion. I think this Dominion needs analysis, and with better understanding their perspective, their aims and goals, we can contrast this against the views of the Empire and the Stormcloaks and get a more complete picture. Most obviously, if it wasn't clear by the initiation of the Great War, the Thalmor, which is the governing body of the Old Merry Dominion, were determined to wipe out the Empire and re-establish Elven supremacy upon Tamriel. The age of man is over and ended with the last Septim Emperor. They are a radical group, but I think for the Thalmor we should delve back into the history books to better understand their philosophical positions and animosity towards the idea of a man-led empire. From a spiritual perspective, the race of the Ultima, the High Elves, believed that they were once like the gods, powerful spirits that were tricked and severed from this divinity by the machinations of Lorcan, who to the Nords is Shaw, or to the Cyrodiilics is Shazar. Also, it is important to note that they view the races of man as descendants of the armies of Lorcan. They were denied the infinite of Anu and were forced to degenerate into flesh-bound beings who required sexual procreation to persist as a people. Very early in history, not long after the elves first came to the Somerset Isles, their form of worship shifted from complex ancestor worship of one's own kin to that of a veneration and worship of only the greatest ancestors, those of kings, champions, wizards, and the like. 
alike. Hence, the elven pantheon emerged, and as religion most often forms the cultural virtues and iniquities, so was born the caste system, a desire for purity and excellence, virtues that have led the eugenic practices and a sense of superiority and purity amongst the elves, especially when compared to what they would consider the savage races of man. The Somerset Isles has remained mostly independent for its history, untouched by the Elysian Empire, and paying tithes and lip service only to the Riemann Empire. It was not until the days of Tiber Septim at the end of the Second Era that the Somerset Isles was ever truly conquered. Famously, the Numidium, a great walking brass tower of Duema design, was gifted to Tiber by Vivek during the armistice with Morrowind, and he and his battle mage Zurin Arctis worked on its reconstruction. There's a lot to this story, but again, we're sticking to the orthodox understandings of history because this is what 99% of Tamriel's population understands to be the case and hence acts upon that knowledge, even if incomplete perhaps. Regardless, the Numidium was reactivated under the control of Time Septum, and he took it to the Somerset Isles and unleashed untold devastation, defeating the Old Merry Dominion, subduing the Elven people, and forcing them into vassalage in his new empire, a fully united Tamriel. Naturally, you can imagine the Elves may be a little salty at the idea of worshipping a man who became God, the only one to conquer them with such dominance and destruction. Consider also that the Elves live especially long lives, and some of the most magically inclined among them could have living memory of Somerset's conquest at the hands of Tiber Septum some 630-ish years ago. Somerset's culture is staunch in their values, laws, and customs, as well as determined to see them preserved if not reign supreme. There long has been tension with the High Elves and the Empire of Man. In fact, the very first Old Mary Dominion, an alliance of Somerset, Valenwood, and elsewhere as it is today, was conceived by Queen Irene. This source by Icantar of Shimmerine, the Sapiarch of Indoctrination, says... Orcs, Dark Elves, and men, most of all men, are best at war. They have drenched the mainland of Tamriel in rivers of blood. As long as their follies were confined to murdering one another, what they did in and around their so-called Imperial City was beneath the notice of the Ultima of Somerset. Then came the Dragon Break. That catastrophe was entirely the fault of men, but the Ultima had to repair it. Now the men of the Empire have catastrophically blundered again, and all Nern is threatened. Our good queen has had no choice but to form the Old Merry Dominion to conquer Cyrodiil, and ensure for the good of all who dwell in Nern that men never again tamper with forces beyond their comprehension and competence. Only the Old Merry, the High Elves and their noble allies, the Wood Elves and Catmen, have the wisdom and restraint to peaceably rule the disparate peoples of Tamriel. Though we are reluctant to take up this burden, events have shown that we must. Recent events prove that the Dragon Break was not a unique event. Men always follow the destructive path of their defender and apologist, the missing god whom we shall not name. This ends here. Once again, elves shall rule Tamriel from White Gold Tower, this time forever. This of course takes place during the Three Banners War, which is the initial premise of the Elder Scrolls Online, and the dominion of this day seems far more forgiving and less radical than its contemporary counterpart, which is telling. But still, the ultimate goal is lane clear as day. The elves believe that their long lives and natural superiority gives them the right to rule Tamriel, that only they have the wisdom and foresight to steward the world. The First Old Mary Dominion breaks apart some time before the end of the Second Era, and towards the end of that time, Year 830 of the Second Era, a second Old Merry Dominion rose, took control of Valenwood, and established a defensive block against outsiders such as the Clovians. That was until the coming of Tiber Septim in 852 of the Second Era. Imperial conquests and the subsequent march of the Numidium ravaged the Somerset Isles and forced them to bend the knee. The second Old Merry Dominion was over. Clearly, the High Elves would not be fond of the idea of Talos, or Imperial rule. And while the rulers of Somerset played the game, it would seem that another organization within, a more radical group, were playing the long game, seeking both revenge and a reinstatement of what they believe is the natural order, Elves ruling Tamriel. This played out fully throughout the course of the Fourth Era, with a coup within Somerset, Valenwood, and then an alliance with Elsewhere, the Third Old Merry Dominion was formed. But Let's have a look at the leadership of this dominion, the governing body that is the Thalmor. 
The Thalmor's history is one of relative obscurity. Before the Old Mary Dominions, the Thalmor was an obscure Old Mary council tasked by the rulers of the day to safeguard Old Mary heritage. Their position was elevated to that of an executive arm of the first Old Mary Dominion under Queen Irene, a liaison between the Bosma, Khajiit and Ultima, incorporating members from each race. Certain previous standing government bodies were incorporated and put under the authority of the Thalmor, such as the Divine Prosecution. The first Old Mary Dominion fell and the Thalmor more again were front and center of the rise of the second. The third edition Pocket Guide to the Empire says, for centuries, the Bosma were obedient, if not particularly loyal, subjects of the Cyrodiilic Empire. At the fall of the Cyrodiilic Empire in 430 of the Second Era, the Camerons attempted to reinstate their authority over the other kingdoms, but culturally each had drifted too far away to be united. Without any other greater power to rein in their ambitions, they began to war against one another, the Khajiit to the east and the Clovians to the north. Valenwood ate away at itself and offered no resistance to the coastal encroachments of the Marama of Pyandania. It took another out outside force to reunify Valenwood, the home of the ancient Bosma, Somerset Isle. The unified elven kingdom of Valenwood and Somerset, the Old Mary Dominion was the most stable power in Tamriel until the coming of Tiber Septim. The new government of Valenwood was called the Thalmor, a congress of Bosmeri chieftains and Old Mary diplomats. While not particularly popular, the Thalmor proved better than the chaos of the previous years and endured until Tiber Septim's armies swept it away. Of course, then we come to the most recent incarnation of the Old Mary Dominion, reformed early in the Fourth Era, with again the Thalmor, seemingly grown more radical during Imperial occupation, at their head. Famously, the Thalmor take credit for the ending of the Oblivion Crisis and defending Somerset from the Daedra, and then there is the assassination of Potento de Cato, who was stewarding the Empire. While this assassination is not confirmed to be a Thalmor exploit, it did most certainly serve their goals, thrusting the Empire into the Stormcrown Interregnum. With the Empire submerged in this mayhem, the Thalmor were quick to act. They overthrew the rightful kings and queens of the Ultima. I remember the revulsion and horror that took hold when word reached me that this dementia had gripped my homeland. Once so proud and majestic, many of our great race actually embraced this insanity. Then the first of many pogroms descended on Somerset Isle. They slaughtered any who were not of the blood of the Ultima, a fine excuse to purge the dissidents as well. The Thalmor have never been ones to waste such an opportunity. During this time, the Thalmor were able to depose the King of Somerset and seize the Isles, renaming them Alanor. By year 29 of the Fourth Era, the Old Mary Dominion was created once more, with Alanor and Valenwood in union, after a Thalmor-backed coup was successful against all Imperial-backed factions within. After this time, contact with the Empire was severed. The long-lived Elves of Alanor were playing the long game. They endured over four centuries of Imperial rule. They could manage to prepare for another hundred years or so before their Revenge. Year 98 of the Fourth Era, the two moons, Massa and Secunda, disappear, a time known as the Void Knights, and by year 100, they return. The Thalmor take credit for bringing them back, and this purchases great influence amongst the Khajiit of Elsewhere, who depend on the moons greatly. By year 115, the Elsewhere Confederacy of 16 tribes dissolves into the two kingdoms of Anaquina and Palantine, and they are formed as client states of the Old Mary Dominion. For over 50 years, the Dominion schemes and gathers its strength before initiating the Great War in year 171. On the 30th of Frostfall, Ye 171 of the Fourth Era, the Old Mary Dominion sent an ambassador to the Imperial City with a gift in a covered cart and an ultimatum for the new Emperor. The long list of demands included staggering tributes, disbandment of the blades, outlawing the worship of Talos, and ceding large sections of Hammerfell to the Dominion. Despite the warnings of his generals of the Empire's military weakness, Emperor Titus Mede II rejected the ultimatum. The Thalmor ambassador upended the cart, spilling over a hundred heads on the floor, every blade's agent in Somerset and Valenwood. And so began the Great War, which would consume the Empire and the Old Mary Dominion for the next five years. We are familiar with the rest of the story. The White Gold Concordant has signed peace between the Thalmor and the Empire with certain conditions, chief among them the Outlaw of Talos worship. You know the story. Today, the Thalmor are ever more intertwined with Imperial politics, with diplomats and justiciars present throughout, maintaining a keen eye to make sure that the terms of the Concordat are upheld, and most certainly also to spy and report the ongoings to the upper echelons of Alanor. 
The values and goals of the Thalmor and the broader Old Mary Dominion on the face of it are quite simple. They want to destroy the Empire and reinstate elven dominance upon Tamriel, a state of affairs not seen since the days of the Merethic Era some 4,500 years ago. To them, conflict is inevitable, and this peace treaty is just a time for preparation. The Thalmor are a radical group, staunchly pro Old Mary, believing in the racial superiority of the High Elves. Make no mistake, unlike previous Dominions, the Thalmor today are explicitly pro Old Ultima, the Khajiit and Bosma are secondary constituents. Let's just say no one thinks the Thalmor would be happy with a Khajiit on the ruby throne instead. You can also get into the more speculation-heavy Michael Kirkbride-sourced intentions of the Thalmor, which does have grounding in established lore. The idea the Thalmor want to undo the world of Lorcan, in which they are trapped, so that they can reunite with Anu as eternal spirits. The myth of man is temporal, remove Talos from the heavens, yada yada. We've made videos on the complex theory craft and conspiracy type stuff regarding the Thalmor. Like I've said, I just want to keep it to the more orthodox, concrete understandings. On the face of it, the Thalmor want to rule Tamriel. The idea that men hold the ultimate power in Tamriel, the Empire, is an affront to them, and so it is an insult, the idea that they should validate the worship of Talos, a man becoming god. Heresy, they say. Not only is it any man, but the very man that subjugated Somerset with a super weapon like the Numidium, aka metaphysical hacks, all of which is a great damage to the proud race of the Ultima. The Dominion are clearly set up to be the villains of the Elder Scrolls. You know, secret police capturing dissidents, shadow government espionage, ethnic cleansings, racial supremacy, you know, the whole pastiche of la bad guy hallmarks. I've heard some compare them to Ulfric and the Stormcloaks in terms of their treatment of races other than their own. And while the Stormcloaks aren't an a student in terms of racial tolerance, the Thalmor are a whole different level. While true, Ulfric and the Stormcloaks favour Nords and want independence from foreign interests, they aren't exactly calling for a cleansing Tamriel of man and controlling the religious worship of others. It is fundamentally a self-determination, freedom-oriented movement. Stormcloaks aren't the poster child for racial acceptance, but the attitude is no way comparable to the Thalmor's eugenic superiority complex. I'd argue that in general, amongst the Nords, and even Imperials and other men, merit and virtue is more important compared to the Elves and their common views on purity of blood and heritage. I can imagine a Stormcloak respecting a Clovian Imperial rejecting and fighting against the Empire's corruption far more than a Nord who conceded to the Empire and gave up on Talos, whereas with the Thalmor, no matter the merit, your race and heritage would determine the limits of your work. Far more specific to the Skyrim Civil War, the Thalmor will try to intervene where necessary to keep Skyrim in a season unending, a perpetual civil war so that it drains the resources of the Empire, making them an easier defeat in the Second Great War to come. Obviously, when you get to the problems with the Old Merry Dominion, the most immediately clear fact is that if you aren't a purebred High Elf, good luck Chuck, because this place is gonna suck. The Thalmor employ subterfuge, espionage, and manipulation extremely well, as shown by their track record, and this is important for them because I'd argue their ability to control their current and future territories will hinge on these skills. Propaganda is a necessity. It's not like the rest of Tamriel is naturally going to come to the conclusion that the High Elves are the best race and should rule us all. The High Elves are also one of the least populous races, so military numbers are a consideration. It is doubtful that they would be able to hold all of Tamriel without thoroughly dogmatizing client states and subordinate races, whereas the Empire incorporates a more bureaucratic structure, accessible by all races, with differing levels of rule and application of law in the provinces. You also have the many benefits for the vassal states that we have discussed prior, resources, security, infrastructure, etc. Clearly, as we can see in Skyrim, there are many fat and happy Jarls, Thanes, and citizens that enjoy the luxuries the Empire affords. Many are not attached to them, ideologically even, rather just the material benefits they bring and so will willingly participate and vassalize for the sake of those benefits when ideology fails. Arguably, the Old Merry Dominion could also bring these benefits in some capacity, but I think fundamentally, the proposition for rule is distasteful to most, especially to the races of men which make up most of Tamriel's population. The rulers of this Old Merry Tamriel would be fundamentally opposed to the races they govern. You also must consider that even for many elves in Valenwood and Alanor, the Thalmor is not desirable. They police dissidents non-stop, evidenced for example by the Night of Green Fire, where they chase down Old Merry refugees escaping the new regime, all the way to Hammerfell, and burn 
burnt down an entire refugee quarter to kill them. It would be the upper echelons that dictate the dogma and there is no space for conversation, no freedom of speech, no dissent, or you may just end up disappearing. Such is certainly the case in Valenwood where regular purges occur, wiping out malcontents, such as what happened with the family of Malborn, the Wood Elf servant in the Thalmor Embassy. Overall, the problem with the Thalmor is that you may not be a High Elf and that you may be a High Elf with other ideas or perhaps virtues that transcend supremacy of your own race. And maybe you don't like being psyoped 24-7. Now we get to the practical assessments part of the video where we distance ourselves somewhat from the philosophical assessments and just get down into the details of what could actually happen based on the information we have. I'm breaking this section down into several considerations and potentialities that could affect the outcome of the Skyrim Civil War. However, bear in mind at the end of the day, Bethesda will ultimately conclude it with whatever narratively makes sense for the story they want to tell. We can first address the proverbial elephant in the room, the Dragonborn. You, as the main character in The Elder Scrolls V Skyrim, are a Dragonborn hero of demigod-like prowess who presumably, throughout the course of the main story, gains untold mastery of the Thorm, defeats Alduin and Mirak, and earns the respect and admiration of all. After all, the quest season unending has both sides of the war deferring to your respected judgement as saviour of the world, so naturally an argument can be made for either side depending on whom the Dragonborn allies with. Either victory is practically possible in this case. I mean, the Dragonborn can call storms, dominate and ride dragons, shout down walls, become ethereal. In a lore reading of the Dragonborn character, he's like the first era tongues on steroids. So honestly, I do find this conversation somewhat boring because the Dragonborn is the cheat code here but let's look at some of the other considerations. We discussed before how the assassination of Titus Mead II will likely be considered a canon event, as faction quest lines have usually been treated in the past, and hence whatever empire exists in the Elder Scrolls VI will have a different emperor. The practical ramifications of this assassination could even perhaps be beneficial, given that the Elder Council seems to think so, but this could be purely from a perspective of self-interest for the conspirators, rather than for the good of the empire, but to flip that around again, being that the members of the Elder Council wield so much power because they administrate an empire, it's likely they are interested in an heir that would further the empire's standing on the world stage. Regardless, the assassination could be problematic. Other vassals seeing this as an opportunity to assert their independence, as Hammerfell and Eastern Skyrim have done. Heads of state dying isn't typically a good thing for stability, however there could possibly be a younger, more charismatic heir chosen, one without the baggage of their predecessors' fluctuating reputation conceding to the White Gold Concordat and all that. Honestly, I do hope that Bethesda for Elder Scrolls VI decides on a new Emperor successor that is far fierier and far more charismatic, someone who seeks to put the Empire back on the path to glory ASAP, a kind of Aurelian type figure. It would be very cool. Speculation aside, it would be fair to say that the assassination of Titus Mead II would have implications for political stability. A more grounded consideration is that of the army at Pale Pass. According to the information found in the Imperial or Stormcloak missives regarding Fort Newgrad, it would seem that avalanches have blocked the Pale Pass, which is the main entry to Skyrim from Cyrodiil, and on the other side are Imperial reinforcements to come. A new Imperial force assembling in the south, ready to advance on our position as Pale Pass is clear. How quickly they clear the pass and move the reinforcements across is unknown, and this will help determine the outcome of the Civil War. If Ulfric can use this fortunate advantage and manage to take control of Skyrim before the reinforcements can clear the pass and join the fight, then they will likely, when arriving in a Stormcloak-controlled Skyrim, rethink their tactics and retreat, rather than being sent to fight a nation on its own. On the flip side, however, if the Pale Pass is cleared quicker, then potentially this army would further the Imperial War efforts dramatically, quelling the rebellion with speed. It's hard to say which outcome is likely as it kind of depends on how long this Pale Pass takes to clear, and even then, it depends on the efficacy of this Imperial force. It's not specific whether this is an entire new legion or just some replenishing reinforcements. Either way, we do know that the Empire has other issues at hand, fortifying their southern borders with the Dominion, and that this Stormcloak Rebellion is being quite the drain on resources. General Talia says this much if defeated at the hands of Ulfric. The Thalmor dossier on Ulfric also confirms this. There is another consideration I do see neglected in conversations about the Civil War. The Thalmor want a persistent problem for the Empire. Obviously, a quick Imperial win in Skyrim and then reallocation of resources is the worst thing for the Thalmor, but on the other hand, 
The Stormcloak victory is also problematic. The Empire would withdraw all troops and all of their forces would likely to be recalled to Cyrodiil, making it harder to take in a second great war. Additionally, the Thalmor would also have to contend with an independent Skyrim and an already independent Hammerfell. Hammerfell is the wildcard here. The book The Great War says this. In the end, the heroic Red Guards fought the old Merry Dominion to a standstill, although the war lasted for five more years and left Southern Hammerfell devastated. The Red Guards say that this proves that the White Gold Concordat was unnecessary and that if Titus II had kept his nerve, the old Merry could have been truly defeated by the combined forces of Hammerfell and the rest of the Empire. The truth of that assertion can, of course, never be known, but the Red Guards should not forget the great sacrifice of Imperial blood, Breton and Nord and Cyrodiilic at the Battle of the Red Ring that weakened the Dominion enough to allow the eventual Second Treaty of Stross Mackay in year 180 of the Fourth Era and the withdrawal of the Old Merry forces from Hammerfell. I can only give my best guess, but I do believe that Hammerfell, in the case of the Second Great War, would be able to be practical and ally with the Empire in a defensive pact against the Dominion. However, on equal footing as allies, I doubt they would ever become vassals of the Imperial regime again, at least not in the foreseeable centuries. Funnily enough, I can imagine a similar situation for Skyrim, especially considering that there will be somewhat of a regime change with the installation of a new Emperor in Cyrodiil following the assassination of Titus Mede. Make no mistake, the Stormcloaks think the Empire are milk-drinking cowards with no right to rule Skyrim, but they have a deep-seated hatred of the Thalmor. Ulfric is keenly aware of the true enemy. Listen again to the final dialogue between Tullius and Ulfric in the case of a Stormcloak victory. You realize this is exactly what they wanted. What who wanted? The Thalmor. They stirred up trouble here. Forced us to divert needed resources and throw away good soldiers quelling this rebellion. It's a little more than a rebellion, don't you think? Ah. <sighs> we aren't the bad guys, you know. Maybe not, but you certainly are the good guys. Perhaps you're right. But then what does that make you? You just said it yourself. It makes us right. And if I surrender? The Empire, I remember, never surrendered. A great darkness is growing, and soon we will be called to fight it on these shores or abroad. The Old Mary Dominion may have defeated the Empire, but it has not defeated Skyrim! It's a small line slipped in there, but it does seem fighting abroad is a possibility for Ulfric. He wants to take down the Dominion, even if that means an eventual offensive. An alliance with an independent Hammerfell is also a possibility, especially in the case of an existential threat. I think I've talked your ears off enough about the Civil War. There is so much to think about, and so much of it is skewed by your own sets of values, whether they are rooted more so in virtue or pragmatism, in the spiritual or the material. Skyrim's Civil War is complicated. There are so many views to consider, so much subjective context to look at, and at the end of it all, you're just gonna side with the one that resonates with you the most. I'm at the point where I can greatly respect either perspective, Stormcloak or Imperial. You just need to understand their values. Thalmor, not so much. While I understand it, they're a pretty irredeemable bunch. Get into the comments below and join the discussion. Like the video if you enjoy these longer Elder Scrolls videos. Oh, and by the way, you know how we did an ideal Elder Scrolls 6 over 10 years ago? And another more specific one in 2019 with the Elder Scrolls 6 Hammerfell idea? Well, we're working on a new magnum opus, including a discussion of everything, setting, lore, gameplay mechanics, skills, perks, the lot. It'll be our biggest video yet, so subscribe and keep your eyes peeled. See ya.